Violent confrontations at places of worship. Tonight, a Hindu temple targeted by protesters, the first of a series of confrontations in Brampton and Mississauga. Good evening. The prime ministers of Canada and India are among the leaders condemning the violence. Three people have been arrested and a Peel police officer has been suspended. CTV's Raheem Ladani joins us live with the story. Raheem. Nathan and Michelle, good evening. A demonstration is now underway in front of this Hindu temple in Brampton. The individuals behind me are waving both Indian and Canadian flags. They're also been, they have also been chanting, calling out Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, calling out the Khalistan movement and now demanding justice. The members of the community who are here say that this demonstration is a counter-protest to the violence that unfolded yesterday. Now, there is a police presence. Peel police officers are across the street. They are here to make sure that this demonstration remains peaceful, something that did not happen yesterday. Many people stand here. Azad Goyet was here at the Hindu Sabha temple on Sunday afternoon, taking part in a financial workshop for seniors, which was being led by consular officials from India. Who is a terrorist? India! It was their presence that brought six separatists to the place of worship, holding banners in support of the Khalistan movement, which is seeking to create a separate sovereign state for six within India's Punjab province. Social media video shows demonstrators clashing with those at the temple, with people being hit with flags and sticks. They entered in the property and they hit with, with, the, with the stick. This is, this is very unfortunate and it is not acceptable. Among the group of demonstrators is believed to be an off-duty police officer. Peel police say they are aware and that this officer has since been suspended. Another video shows a uniformed police officer swinging his fist into a crowd before grabbing a stick. Whosoever was involved in, in the, 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 using, the, using the inappropriate uh, force uh, against the devotee, they must be terminated. Canadian officials at all levels of government are condemning the violence. Local councillors say tensions are mounting within the South Asian community. It's getting very political, it's getting very nasty, um, especially when it gets drawn on uh, religious lines. Later that night, two more demonstrations emerged, this time in Mississauga, including one at the Sri Guru Singh Sabha Maltin Gurdwara. Sikh groups say the demonstrators were not Sikh protesters, but instead part of a pro-India group. Police arrested and charged three people. I hope that those responsible are held fully accountable. Um, and I think that will be a chilling effect for those that want to copycat this, this incident. There are limits uh, to the right to protest. India's prime minister is also weighing in, saying, I strongly condemn the deliberate attack on a Hindu temple in Canada. Equally appalling are the cowardly attempts to intimidate our diplomats. Such acts of violence will never weaken India's resolve. We expect the Canadian government to ensure justice and uphold the rule of law. The incident comes weeks after Ottawa expelled six Indian diplomats, linking them to the killing of a Sikh separatist leader in 2023 on Canadian soil. It has accused the Indian government of conducting a broad campaign against South Asian dissidents in Canada, something New Delhi denies. The crowd continues to grow this hour. There are easily hundreds of people in attendance. As for the three individuals who were arrested, they were arrested during the protests in Mississauga, not at this temple yesterday. They are all men. They range in age from 23 to 43, and they are facing charges from assaulting a police officer to assault with a weapon. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. Nathan, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Raheem. To a scary incident caught on camera, York Regional Police are searching for suspects after shots were fired at a home in Georgina. <laughs> Investigators released surveillance video of the incident. It happened around 11 last night outside a home on Danny Wheeler Boulevard near Vallejo Street. No injuries were reported, but police found several shell casings in the area. They're searching for the suspect who fired the gun, as well as the person behind the wheel of the car they were driving. Still ahead, the final push for votes on the last day of campaigning below the border. A look at the razor-thin race for the White House and what the end result could mean for Canada. Parking's already at a premium in Toronto, and it could soon cost even more. The city is considering an increase on metered spots. So just how much could rates rise? Our Beth McDonnell joins us live with those details. Beth. Michelle, drivers and business owners have opinions about this increase, even if it's just 25 cents an hour. 
Finding an on-street parking spot means paying for the duration of your stay. And in the near future, drivers could be paying more for the privilege. The second increase within a year. Everything is expensive, now the parking is expensive. So why are we not staying five, seven, they're still making money anyways. After being stable for seven years, the Toronto Parking Authority rates increased from a range between $1 and $5, depending on the demand in an area, to between $1.50 and $6.50 this year. The authority is now proposing an increase for next year of 25 cents an hour in all but the lowest price spots, making the cost up to 6.75 an hour. Another 25 cents is not going to make a big difference, but the, the way that they do that for uh, always increase the money to make people to pay more, I, I guess they, they need to stop it. I think there's other revenue tools that the city has, uh, lengthening the hours Sunday morning. No one pays to park on Sunday morning. Why is that? Like, just make people park sun pay to park Sunday morning. The 25 cent increase is expected to generate more than $5 million in revenue and impacts more than 20,000 metered spots along with 112 green pea lots. The owner of this framing store on Ossington believes the increase is reasonable but is concerned about the number of spots disappearing. I think it's to be expected. Everything's going up. Uh, the problem that we have in this area, I think, is that there's an exchange of value that isn't quite there. I think they're closing a green pea around the corner and not replacing those spots. So uh, I, it, it, it seems a bit like they're unfixing things. That lot is slated for affordable housing. When it comes to the price, the authority says parking rates in Toronto remain low compared to other large North American cities. You know, we have those old machines and we need to put in the new machines. So they're the credit card tap machines. Bringing up the infrastructure to that market level that everybody expects in the city in 2024, plus getting people moving out of their spots. And I think it's a pretty good deal when you have to pay a lot to park downtown in other areas if you're in a private lot. Fletcher says the cost of the spots take into account a business perspective to accommodate a turnover of customers. To compare with some other places, people can pay up to $11 an hour in Vancouver. You can pay up to $9.35 an hour in Chicago and $9 an hour in New York. Reporting live on Ossington, I'm Beth McDonnell. Michelle and Nathan, back to you. Thank you, Beth. From increasing costs to park to a sudden jump in the cost of childcare. Some parents facing a huge expense as private operators decide to pull out of a national childcare program. CTV's Janice Golding joins us live to explain. Janice. Hi, Nathan. Yes, we've learned that some child care centers are going to be raising their fees significantly come January after they announce they're going to be opting out of the $10 a day national child care program. CTV News has learned at least two private daycare centers will opt out of the national $10 a day child care program in the new year, meaning a hefty fee hike for parents. Parents of both Sunnyside Daycare and Teddy Bear Academy on High Park Avenue were informed by letter that they have until the end of the month to decide whether to withdraw their children. Each center has indicated they'll cease participating in the Canada-wide early learning and child care program that has reduced parent fees by more than 50% since it was first implemented in 2022. That will be something that that owner-operator um, thought long and hard about, was probably very uh, worried about, didn't want to do. Letters from the daycares read, there are two important elements to be aware of regarding the new tuition. A, there has only been one increase in tuition since October 2019. And B, participation in Seawelk after COVID-19 restricted any fee increases during this period. Meaning factoring in deferred increases, parents will face fee hikes of around 17% for infants, 18% for toddlers, and 19% for preschool age children. Well, I find that very unfortunate that uh, child care centers would look at pulling out of the, uh, the program. While Ontario's education minister expressed her regrets, the province has repeatedly expressed deep concerns about the sustainability of the program without more funding. This is their signature program, yet the province of Ontario has provided three times the amount of funding that the, uh, the federal government has. In August, the province announced a new funding structure that would be implemented on January 1st, saying it would give operators more spending flexibility, with funding to be based on region, the number of spaces they operate, and how many children they serve in each age group. 
However, the Association of Daycare Operators of Ontario, which represents more than 400 owner-operators, says it's not that simple. The process of figuring out how this new funding formula is going to impact your centre is really pretty complicated. And then, once you think you know, you have to have a meeting with your municipality. And while Andrea Hannon says this is not a choice daycare providers want to be making, many feel they've been left with no choice at all if they want to keep their doors open. Now, ADCO says operators are also concerned about government over-involvement in their day-to-day -day business, saying they're concerned about being mired down in red tape. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Nathan. Thank you, Janice. Also tonight, voters head to the polls in Don Valley West. We check in with the front runners and explain how the results could impact the way City Hall operates. But first, let's take a live look outside. Cloudy, unsettled conditions today, but mild for this time of year. And do you notice it is now dark out there this hour? Good thing there's all those lights downtown. We turned the clocks back over the weekend. Sunset time was 5.03 tonight. And as we bring up the satellite radar, you can see the unsettled conditions uh, this afternoon and into the evening. You know, maybe some rain here or there, but really the chance of rain lessens as we head into the evening hours. Currently, look at these temperatures. 16 in Hamilton, 19 Niagara Falls, 20 degrees in Windsor. If we zone into Toronto proper, we've got 13 degrees at the islands this hour. Cloudy conditions, 13 at Pearson. And tonight, really, the temperature is going to be steady around 15 degrees, which is so mild. And guess what? We're we're going to warm up even more tomorrow. It's weird to say you don't need a jacket in November. More weather when we return. We turn now to the race to fill a vacant seat at Toronto City Hall. A by-election is being held in Don Valley West. The polls close in just under two hours, and the outcome is expected to have important implications here in our city. Our Natalie Johnson joins us live with all the details. Natalie. Well, City Hall has been watching this by-election very closely, Michelle. There are just two years left in this term, but the result of this race could have longer-lasting impacts on the municipal political landscape. Good morning. Oh, hi. Rachel Ternus Lynn cast her ballot in Don Valley West today. Thank you. In her by-election bid to become councillor for the ward. As our message was getting out and we got to more and more doors, you could just feel this groundswell. Two, three. Chernos Lynn is the candidate who was pulled ahead of the progressive pack, now backed by a broader left-leaning coalition of candidates and campaigns in an effort to beat once front-runner Anthony Fury. we got to turn Toronto around in a positive way uh, and bring some common sense to City Hall, and that's what I'm energized to do. The former mayoral candidate has been under attack for not living in the ward, accused of using this council race as a springboard for future mayoral ambitions. Do we want to make sure that we have local responsive uh, government to our needs at the local level or are we talking about the mayor or even bigger political issues throughout the country? I know the area well and it's going to be an honour to serve as their councillor should the voters so please and I think it's unfortunate that uh, we've seen a lot of uh, negative energy coming from other campaigns. We're all about the positive messaging here. The right-wing columnist has drummed up support on the street Good luck. I think it's between you and the other one. while polarizing others. I'm really hoping uh, all of that support will rally behind uh, the best bet to not have Anthony Fury in charge. He's a little too right wing. Beyond the broader effort by some to keep Fury out of Toronto City Hall, where his politics would clash with the mayor's. When I agree with her, we're going to work together for the residents. And when I voice a disagreement, well, you know, I think that's uh, going to happen as well. So there we go. There is hope within the ward that the winner of this race will deal with some of the issues that matter most to voters here. I think it's housing. Affordable housing. Traffic, transit. Cost of living is above and beyond. The question now is who and how many of them will vote. It's always great when someone likes your Instagram post about bringing common sense change to City Hall, but that doesn't make up for the vote. Listen, every vote counts. Bye. The steward of the Don Valley West Ward will be revealed tonight as Toronto City Hall watches on. And the polls in Don Valley West remain open until 8 o'clock tonight. Both sides acknowledging that this race could well be very close. We will bring you the result and reaction tonight at 1130. Reporting live at City Hall, I'm Natalie Johnson, Michelle and Nathan. Over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Millions of Americans are also going to the polls in a presidential race seen as one of the closest in recent memory. This is the final night of campaigning for both candidates who are making a last push for every vote. We begin with Donald Trump, who made stops in three battleground states. CTV Genevieve Beauchemin reports. Yeah. 
Donald Trump's last day of campaign rallies began with a stop in swing state North Carolina. Hello, beautiful, beautiful North Carolina. There, after a weekend of railing against the voting system, he mused about hitting back at former First Lady Michelle Obama. She said electing Trump again would bring a backward vision of America. My genius is, I'm telling you, they said, just take it easy. Well, what do you mean? She said bad about me. I can't hit back. Sir, you're winning. Just relax. Trump is campaigning in key states in the Rust Belt, the manufacturing center of the U.S., in Pennsylvania, and in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he has ended all his previous campaigns. His voice is raspy, but he insists he's in fine form. I don't even sleep, you know. You know, I've gone through 62 days, 62 days without a day off. Tomorrow's the big day! Celebration, baby! We're gonna do it! We're gonna do it! A handful of supporters were rallying voters near Trump's waterfront estate of Mar-a-Lago. It's going to be a close race, but I think we're going to do it. They say they know how closely Canada and the world are watching. It was here in West Palm Beach 720 days ago that Trump announced he would run for president once again. He spent election night the first time in New York, then in Washington. He will be back here tomorrow night at this convention center where security is getting tighter and tighter. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, West Palm Beach, Florida. Kamala Harris is spending all of her time on the eve of the election in Pennsylvania. It could go a long way tomorrow in determining who wins the White House. CTV's Joy Malvin is following her campaign. So this is it for Vice President Kamala Harris closing out on a hopeful, optimistic message, selling the idea of a new way forward in a sharply split nation and a race that has barely budged. We have the momentum because our campaign is tapping into the ambitions, the aspirations, and the dreams of the American people. And make no mistake, we will win. No mention of Donald Trump, and that is intentional. Taking her message of unity to five cities in Pennsylvania and its prize of 19 electoral votes. A big advantage for Harris, women. Polls show reproductive rights are driving up the numbers. And though Trump is stoking claims of cheating and voter fraud, Philadelphia out with this warning. If you're going to try to bully people, bully votes or voters, you're going to try to erase votes, you're going to try any of that nonsense, we're not playing. F around and find out. In Washington, businesses boarding up, metal fencing and other safety measures around the White House and Harris's home at the Naval Observatory. All of it making some voters anxious. I've been limiting my um, access to the news. I just, I just want this nightmare to be over. Harris is banking on last-minute undecided voters capping off her campaign in Pennsylvania tonight with a star-studded rally starring Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, and Oprah. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. CTV News Chief Political Correspondent Vashi Capellos has been following all the latest developments and joins us now from Washington. Vashi, what are you hearing in D.C. about how tight this race is? Everybody here seems to be holding their breath. It's largely a Democratic area, but I'm not sure, if, you probably can't see, but in the area behind me, the amount of security has certainly been increased around the perimeter of the White House. There's a whole new perimeter, for example, Nathan. There's additional Secret Service deployed to the Vice President's residence and a host of other locations. So it's quiet here, but it's tense. And like I said, everyone's holding their breath. They think this thing is a genuine toss-up. So what could the final result mean for Canada? A lot of things, and, and largely dependent on who wins. I mean, Donald Trump has talked about 10 percent tariffs across the board on all imports, including Canadian. He's talked about reopening up NAFTA, and instead of just a review in 2026, a full renegotiation. And if you could get any solace, perhaps, at the thought of Kamala Harris winning, you might not be able to if you're a Canadian or someone very involved in the Canadian economy, because she, too, has also, you know, kind of uh, talked about the idea of renegotiating NAFTA, reopening the whole thing up again, a little bit of deja vu from the first Trump presidency back in 2016 when we spent about three years doing exactly that. She was one of 10 senators also to vote against that deal. Originally, she thought it didn't go far enough on climate change. So they come at it from different perspectives, but 
on the whole, protectionism has increased. And why is that so consequential for a country like Canada? Well, three quarters of every single thing we export from this country goes to one single destination, the United States. It's going to be a big election, not only for Americans, but for Canada as well, Nathan. Wow, the, the race tight, security tight. What's the mood like? It's tense. I, I feel like this is as polarized as the polls, as polarized a country as the polls make it out to, to seem, Nathan. I think that they voters feel like they have this binary choice, which makes tomorrow so fascinating because it will all come down to these undecided or swing voters in these key swing states, seven states. Basically, that's it. A few hundred thousand people essentially could determine the outcome of this. And since they have this binary choice, the fact that they haven't made a choice between those two, I just think adds a whole other layer of complexity. Complexity, and it's going to be so fascinating to see it all roll out tomorrow. I don't know if we're going to get an outcome. Might take a few days for that, but it's a big, big day here in D.C. and right across this country. Yeah, we're going to have to wait and see. CTV News Chief Political Correspondent Vashi Kapelos in Washington. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. And CTV News Channel will have special coverage on election night Tuesday, led by our chief anchor and senior editor Omar Sachedina, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Back here at home, the province introduced a new bill today to recognize veterans. Most soldiers I know are humble. They did or were, are merely doing what they have felt called to do, to serve. The Honoring Veterans Act would expand recognition to living veterans and those who gave their lives in service. It would also create a new award to celebrate the achievements of veterans and condemn any actions which disrespect people who served their country. Ontario is home to roughly 150,000 veterans. He advocated for the Indigenous community and was chair of the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Murray Sinclair has died. We look back at the distinguished career of the champion for human rights. CTV's Mike LeCouture has the story. Throughout his life, Murray Sinclair tried to shine a light on the dark corners of Canada's history, searching for the truth and paving the way for reconciliation. It was education that got us into this, and it will be how we educate our children going forward that will get us out of this. As the head of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he led Canada through a reckoning with its past abuses of Indigenous peoples in residential schools. In a statement, his family said Sinclair committed his life in service to the people, creating change, revealing truth, and leading with fairness throughout his career. The deep convictions and immovable strength he brought to bear on such extraordinary challenges were an inspiration to all of us. Sinclair spent six years documenting the stories of thousands of residential school survivors. It resulted in 94 calls to action and an awakening across the country. He is our Martin Luther King for this country. He saw something that none of us could even envision and brought us all along in that journey of reconciliation. Born in Selkirk, Manitoba, Sinclair was the first Indigenous judge in that province and just the second in Canada. Sinclair's traditional name means the one who speaks of pictures in the sky. The story behind it, of course, is about a young man who goes out to, to seek answers in order to help his people who are living in troubled times. After delivering the TRC report, he was appointed as a senator where he continued his work to make the country a better place for all. He would listen to these places as stories of learning, of possibility, so that we could create a better future for everyone's kids. Murray Sinclair was 73. Mike LeCouture, CTV News, Ottawa. In Ottawa, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees was welcomed to Parliament Hill today. Filippo Grandi met with the Prime Minister to discuss a range of issues. The UNHCR provides food, water, shelter and medical care to refugees around the world. The global organization says it works to ensure everyone who has fled violence, disaster or persecution has the right to seek asylum and find refuge. Coming up, he was considered one of the greatest music producers of our time who influenced every musical genre. We look back at the life and legacy of Quincy Jones. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, if you need a new smartphone, you know how expensive they can be. It's why some people are trying to find deals on Facebook and Kijiji. But be careful you don't get scammed. Fake phones are showing up on these websites. I'll have my reports. That's just ahead. 
Get ready for a Tuesday warm up windy conditions to go along with it though. Tomorrow when you get the kids ready for school, you step out the door at 8 a.m. Expect mainly cloudy conditions, but 18 degrees by noon. We're up to 21 by 3 p.m. Reaching our high of 22 degrees. You won't need a coat tomorrow. Uh, we'll tell, but it is actually just the warmest day of the week and we will be cooling down a little bit more throughout the week. We'll break down your seven day forecast when we return. About 85% of Canadians have a smartphone, and once you have one, they're hard to live without. If you need to replace yours, you can spend between one and $2,000, which is why many people are searching for deals. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Pat. They are Nathan and Michelle. Thank you. If you're trying to save money, you may be tempted to look on Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji to find a bargain on a phone, but two people say they just got scammed buying phones that turned out to be counterfeits. The back of it looks identical to a Samsung. The front of it looks identical. Eric Jerawav Pickering says when he had to replace his current smartphone, he turned to Facebook Marketplace. There he found a Samsung Galaxy S24 for sale. The woman's seller had all the packaging for the phone and a receipt showing it was worth $2,000. This is what I thought I was buying. The package looks quite real. Um, even when you open it, um, it looks identical to the real thing. Jerawa paid $700 for the phone, but later he noticed the receipt had spelling errors and was fake, and the phone was a counterfeit. It wasn't until I actually got home that I realized that I bought some sort of Frankenstein fake Samsung phone. That money could have gone towards my daughter's RESP, and to get scammed, it was devastating. I was unaware that scammers can actually open the box, tamper with the phone, and then reseal it like it was never opened. Nathaniel Lawrence of Scarborough also thought he was buying the latest Samsung phone. He found one on Kijiji that looked like the S24 and gave the seller $550 for it. But it also turned out to be a cheap knockoff. I think they opened it up and customized it to make it say Samsung S24, but it's just a random regular Android phone. Consumer Reports says anyone buying a smartphone through a platform like Facebook or Kijiji is taking a risk. You could be purchasing a phone that is not the phone that you think you're buying. You could be purchasing a broken phone. You could be purchasing a, a stolen phone. If you're trying to save money, check with wireless providers. You can buy older model phones at lower prices, or you can buy refurbished phones from Amazon or Best Buy that will come with a warranty. As soon as Lawrence and Jerawa handed over cash to buy the fake phones, they were ghosted by both sellers, but their ads remain online, hoping to trap more victims. I just don't want other people to fall victim to what I had happen to me. And the fake phones are generally made with old parts and put in casings that look like newer phones. They may also not be safe to use because they could contain viruses or ransomware set up to harvest your data. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Well, we've had the time change. So that's one thing to adjust to. And you would think because it's dark, maybe we'd be getting some snow soon, but no sign of it. In fact, tomorrow, high double digits yeah. once again. It's, I think it makes it easier now that we've fallen back. If we fell back and then it was cold and icy or something, I think we'd be a bit more miserable. I don't know. It's True. not too bad. It's actually a very mild evening to go out for a walk. Potential today for rain, but not too bad. I'll break down the weather picture for you right now. Here's a satellite radar, and you can see the unsettled conditions across the region today. The big story really is the temperatures. 13 degrees right now in Toronto, Trenton, 14 in Wyarton. Look at that, 20 degrees in Win uh, Windsor this hour. And here are the lows for tonight. So we're going to warm up a little bit. Really, it'll be steady this evening at 15 degrees. In yellow there, you can see the number three. Yeah, that's the norm for a low at this point in November. So we do have a temperature treat tonight. And then tomorrow, look at that. We've had so many warm-ups over the past several weeks. And tomorrow, we've got another one. So we're going to get up to 22 degrees in Toronto. The norm is nine. So we are double what you would expect. 
Uh, here's a, the wider weather picture, and you can see unsettled to the north, uh, west, and to the southeast there and across our region. You may have seen some rain today. You may have not. And here's a peek at the warmer air that's pushing its way through overnight and into tomorrow, and that'll be followed by some cooler air where we'll cool down to more seasonal, and then there is another potential for some rain. Let's break down the forecast radar. So you can see by 9 tonight, uh, maybe uh, some showers, but really only a 30% chance of shower this evening. Mostly cloudy conditions if you plan to get out there and enjoy the warm air. And then by tomorrow, cloudy conditions in the morning, in the afternoon, and into the evening. Might even see some sunshine. And then you can see that is the next unsettled system. Wednesday, 3 a.m. We're anticipating some wet weather, but that's overnight. So by the time you get to Wednesday by 1030 in the morning, just cloudy conditions, which isn't too bad. Let's break down the seven days. So tomorrow's that hot spot this week. Then on Wednesday, it cools down, but really it's still way above seasonal with a high of 14 for Wednesday. There's that 60% chance of showers, but Wednesday is not a washout by any means. Wednesday night, if you look at the overnight temperatures, it does cool down. Uh, Thursday, Friday, looking at nice bright sunshine and seasonal conditions with highs of 9 and 10. And then Saturday looks good as well with the sunshine. Bit of cloud could be unsettled on Sunday, but it's still early days. And look ahead at Remembrance Day. It can snow on Remembrance Day, right? You hate it when it's cold for our veterans. Right now, it's looking pretty good with a high of 10 degrees and sunny conditions. Good to know. Also tonight, relearning the skills most of us take for granted. A mother of three shares her story of overcoming not one, but two separate health challenges. One woman's passion for baking has helped her overcome major health hurdles. She suddenly lost the use of one side of her body, but worked diligently to return to the kitchen. TDV's health reporter Pauline Chan has her story. Cracking an egg is a hard-won skill for Patty DeGia. In 2007, she first came to UHN's West Park Rehab after getting her right leg amputated. I was pregnant with my third child, and it was a melanoma that had metastasized to osteosarcoma. So it was stage four at that point, so they had no choice but to amputate. During her rehab, the former photographer developed a passion for baking. But then in 2020, she suffered a brain aneurysm that led to a stroke. And I lost all uh, feeling to my left side. But she returned to West Park, determined to regain her mobility and her independence. The kids were 100% a pure motivator. Like I just, the, I sacrificed the limb just so that I can watch my kids grow up. So it was so, so, so important. OTs use a very holistic lens when it comes to cooking. We don't just look at it as a task. We look at it as an integral part of your health and well-being. We get to assess and progress patients' motor skills, you know, such like their ability to handle equipment in the kitchen. We also get to assess and progress their cognitive skills, like sequencing, planning, organization of a meal. Patty did so well, she was even able to compete in a nationally televised baking competition. And recently, she was the keynote speaker at an event where amateur chefs competed with professionals. Foundation CEO Doug Earl says it was a fundraiser for the Activities of Daily Living program, which is an essential area for patients looking to return to fulfilling lives. That's when you've had a stroke, you've lost a limb, you've had a serious accident, and you're trying to relearn how to do things that we take for granted every day. Uh, how to cook, how to get in and out of a bathtub, how to get in and out of a bed. Patty relearned all those things, and she's grateful for the support of all her therapists. Pauline Chan, CTV News. A reminder tonight that it is time to roll up your sleeves. The Prime Minister visited a pharmacy in Ottawa to get his flu shot. Justin Trudeau also received a COVID-19 booster and urged everyone to take a few minutes to also get both to protect themselves, their loved ones, and their co-workers. Appointments can be booked online or in person, and it is safe to get the flu and COVID-19 vaccines at the same time. He was a titan and a trailblazer in the music industry. The entertainment world is remembering producer Quincy Jones tonight. He worked with the biggest names in music, from Frank Sinatra to Michael Jackson. CTV's Andrea Case has more on Jones's life and legacy.
Born Quincy Delight Jones in Chicago, 1933, he was a trumpet player who became a composer, working with countless musicians and artists over his 70-year career. Fly me to the moon. And we had the best time. It was like being on another planet with him. Frank would say, Q, live every day like it's your last, and one day you'll be right. Chum FM's Jamar McNeil recalls a story of their close relationship. You know, Quincy Jones was told that a black man couldn't produce or, or even write for strings. Frank Sinatra gave him a shot, and he said when they went on tour, and he wasn't allowed to tour with him and go into certain clubs, he said, if he can't come in, I'm not coming in. From old blue eyes to the king of pop. This is Michael Jackson's second solo album, Thriller, is the best-selling album of all time, and it paved the way for black artists on the pop charts. Jones teamed up with Jackson again for the fundraising record We Are the World for famine relief in Ethiopia. I like to think about the studio as a place that's real sacred, you know, where magical things happen. Hopefully, you know, that's what great records are supposed to be about. On the small and big screen, he produced The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He produced the film The Color Purple that received an Oscar for his lifetime achievement. Winning 28 Grammys, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for his exemplary contribution to music. Former Much Music VJ Michael Williams met his friend Q in 1998. I heard it, I cried, and I thought about the times that we spent together, the dinners we had, me cooking for him, the things that I learned from him just by his presence, the things he would say to me. Um, I, uh, I mean, he's the greatest producer to live ever. Quincy Jones was a survivor. He suffered two brain aneurysms in 1974 that almost killed him, but he went right back to work. The father of seven died last night with his family by his side. Quincy Jones was 91. Andrea Case, CTV News. After the break, a golden glove and a possible silver slugger. Blue Jay Dalton Varsho recognized for his defensive prowess, while Vladdy Guerrero is a finalist for his production at the plate. Voting day in the USA. We'll have the final hours of the race and analysis throughout the show as the U.S. votes for its next president. A CP24 breakfast where Toronto gets its everything every morning. They entered in the property and they hit with, with, the, with the stick. This is, this is very unfortunate and uh, it is not acceptable. Updating our top stories, elected officials are condemning violence yesterday at a Hindu temple in Brampton. An off-duty Peel police officer has been suspended for allegedly taking part in a protest there. There were also two demonstrations later in Mississauga. Another 25 things not going to make a big difference, but the, the way that they do that for uh, always increase the money to make people to pay more, I, I guess they, they need to stop it. The Toronto Parking Authority is proposing an increase of 25 cents an hour in all but the lowest price spots for next year. So it would cost up to $6.75 an hour to park. It would be the second increase within a year. I think it's housing. Affordable housing. Rapid transit. Cost of living is above and beyond. Some of the issues on voters' minds in Don Valley West. They're casting their ballots in a by-election to fill a vacant seat at City Hall. We'll learn tonight who the winner is after all the votes are counted. Polls close in just over an hour and ten minutes. Remember to keep up to date day and night at ctvnewstoronto.ca and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. On the markets, the Canadian dollar changed hands at 71.93 U.S. cents, up more than a quarter of a cent. Western Canadian Select Oil was down 7 cents to 56.52 a barrel. And the TSX ended the day at 24,256, up just under one point. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Returning to the big vote south of the border, and provincial politicians will be watching the U.S. election closely. No matter who wins, there will be implications here at home. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris reports. It's a decision that will be made by American voters, but the outcome of the U.S. presidential election is creating a lot of anxiety for Ontario lawmakers. Look, I'm worried for all of us. Uh, if Trump wins. Uh, I'm worried for Canada because I think it will have a significant impact on trade. That worry goes beyond economics. There's real fear about the rising intensity of rhetoric coming from Donald Trump. That's what keeps me up at night, is just the threat of violence and um, 
chaos south of the border. And that's somehow spreading up here. A virus opposition politician say the premier must denounce. Racism, anti-immigrant hate, transphobia, homophobia and misogyny. And, we, and a threat to democracy. And I hope our premier will be brave enough to stand against that kind of commentary. Doug Ford has committed to working with whoever moves into the White House. On the eve of the election stressing, it's more important than ever to preserve and build on our long-standing ties of friendship, trade and cooperation that unite Canada and the United States. Over the last several months, the Premier's been meeting with governors, congressmen and women, urging them to reject protectionism and embrace by can am mentality. To this professor of history and Canadian business, it's shrewd politics. That actually does make a difference because so much of our trade is directed to certain uh, states. And certain industries. For Ontario, it's 80% of our exports go to the United States, uh, primarily automotive metals. While there would be challenges for Ontario with the Kamala Harris presidency, Anastakis explains she'll continue Joe Biden's economic policies. Things like tariffs on Chinese-made cars and steel, which Canada has matched. Trump, on the other hand... He's been pretty volatile in terms of the way he's dealt with trading partners, including very close trading partners like Canada and Ontario. So from economics to potential social and political unrest... This one is kind of for all the marbles in lots of ways. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. The Toronto Raptors kick off a five-game road trip tonight. Fox, job by Brady. Toronto will be looking to build on its 131-128 overtime win against Sacramento on Saturday. Tonight, the 2-5 and five Raptors are in Denver. The Nuggets are 3-3 three and three so far this season. To baseball and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has a chance to win his second American League Silver Slugger Award. And then the power slowly came and then it has really come now. He tattoos that ball to center. Kowser back. That ball is good. The first baseman was named a finalist for the award today. He previously won it in 2021. Guerrero hit 30 homers and drove in 103 runs last season. Mr. Saga's Josh Naylor of the Cleveland Guardians is also nominated at first base. The winner will be announced on November 12th. And here's one in the left center field. On comes Varsho, and he made the catch. Meanwhile, Dalton Varsho is being recognized for his defensive prowess. The Blue Jays center fielder has won a gold glove. The 28-year-old was among 14 first-time winners. Former Jay Matt Chapman picked up his fifth gold glove. Just ahead, paving the way for a pop star. We're just 10 days away. The sign celebrating Taylor Swift's arrival in Toronto after this short break. Tonight from Washington on the eve of America's high-stakes election. Get out and vote. You know that. We are all in this together. The last-minute push in the pivotal battlegrounds and what the result could mean for Canada. Tonight on CTV National News and on ctvnews.ca. And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And a special shout-out to those of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010. Are you ready for it? We're now just over a week away from Taylor Swift's arrival here in Toronto. It's not a red carpet, but today the city unveiled a very big way to welcome the pop star. CTV Sean Lethong has the story. It's a sign of things to come. Welcome to the Eras Tour. In just 10 days, Taylor Swift will play her first of six sold-out shows from her Eras Tour here in Toronto. And from now until the end of November, street signs marking Taylor Swift Way will line the route from Rogers Centre to City Hall. It's nice to welcome Taylor Swift in our own Canadian way. This group of Swifties took time to grab a photo with the sign this afternoon as anticipation is building. I've always been a Taylor Swift fan ever since I was little, since Fearless, I'd say. It's really exciting that she's coming to Toronto. I would say it's extreme levels of excitement right now. I mean, she's playing six nights. <laughs> No artist has ever played the Rogers Centre six times in one tour, but creating Taylor Swift Way isn't just about excitement. We know that Taylor has a significant cultural and economic impact on every city she tours in, and that often includes donating to food banks in the cities where she visits. 
There will be 22 signs hanging along the route until the end of the month, and each one will be auctioned off with the proceeds going to the Daily Bread Food Bank. One in ten Torontonians is having to make use of the Daily Bread Food Bank. They're having to make use of food charity. In a city as wonderful as ours is, that shouldn't be the case. That is why these Taylor Swift signs will be auctioned off. Rogers has paid for the signs and has agreed to match donations up to $113,000. Honestly, it's fun. It's good for the city and a lot of people are having fun, so. With the first auction kicking off today and going until November 10th, with more signs being auctioned off throughout the month. And while the concerts are sold out, some are still sure. hoping. You think you're gonna get tickets? I think so, yeah. <laughs> the six shows are on November 14th, 15th, 16th, 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Sean Lee Thong, CTV News. Taylor has a song called 22, and we're going to hit 22 tomorrow. Temperature-wise, a beautiful shot of our city this hour. Let's go to the satellite radar. You can see the potential uh, for wet weather. It persists tonight, but really only a slight chance. 13 degrees in Toronto right now, even warmer elsewhere across southern Ontario. Your seven-day forecast looks like this. Really warm tomorrow, 22 degrees. Wednesday cools down a bit, but still way above seasonal. There is the chance of showers once again on Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, bright sunshine and bang on seasonal temperatures. Looking nice for Saturday, potentially uh, wet on Sunday and Remembrance Day at this point is looking quite good, although it is early days. That's it for us. Be sure to join Omar Sachedina at 11 tonight for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Almond with your next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For all of us here at CTV News, thanks for watching. Have a great night.